Good evening and good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this African Academy of Science webinar from our Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program, the Grand Challenges Africa. Our webinar today on connecting innovators to opportunities is focused for our search for the Grand Challenges Africa Innovation Network platform GK. Today's webinar will be giving three presentations on the African innovation ecosystem followed by a panel discussion and ending with a question and answer session. So before we begin, a few housekeeping points. To avoid sound disruptions during the meeting, we will mute all participants. Uh, please type in your questions in the chat box at the bottom or on the side. And this webinar, just for all of you to know, is being recorded. I now welcome the AAS Executive Director, Professor Nelson Toto. Welcome, Nelson. Uh, uh, Juliet, um, can you see my screen? Um, Wingcliffe, can I have um, the rise to, 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 to project? Hello. Prof, you can share your Thank screen. You. Yeah, can you see it now? Thank you very much, uh, innovators, partners, colleagues, uh, for joining this webinar. I'm very excited that you could all make the time to be with us this uh, early evening uh, to discuss issues that are of importance to the African continent. Um, before I, you know, let you do what you do best. I just want to give you an overview of the African Academy of Sciences for those of us who are really not familiar with the African Academy of Sciences. So the African Academy of Sciences uh, is a pan-African organization. Uh, we are the only uh, pan-African academy in the African continent. We have a very, very good relationship with African Union. And that's very, very important because of the fact that the only way we can serve the population of Africa is through the African governments. So we've got a good working relationship with Auda NEPAD, uh, which is the um, agency for development that really does the work for the, uh, for the African continent. Uh, the African Academy of Sciences has got a tri tripartite mandate. Firstly, it recognizes excellence, and this is how, as an academy, it brings into the academy the fellows that are recognized for their excellent work. And this also can involve former ministers, and other people that have had impact in areas that are seen by the academy as important uh, in terms of addressing the concerns uh, of African lives. Uh, the academy also plays a role of advisor and think tank. Again, this demonstrates our close association with, with African governments. And most of our energy and most of the money that we spend is spent upon implementing of key science, technology, and innovation programs. And of course, uh, today uh, we are focusing on the innovation aspect, uh, which is really what we uh, seek to drive for the African continent. I mean, like every other organization, uh, the AAS has got um, a strategic plan uh, that focuses on, on those five areas there that you can see, uh, but I'm not going to go through them all. But I think what is critical is that the issue of health and well-being is, is one of uh, paramount importance, simply because of the fact that we are currently facing the pandemic, COVID-19, which is affecting all the citizens of the world. Um, one of our key uh, 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 traits uh, in terms of how we operate uh, as an African Academy of Sciences is that empathy is at the core of our values. Uh, empathy is at the core of our values, and it really seeks to address some of the issues that affect the African continent. Uh, obviously, we know that uh, the African continent uh, carries the high burden of disease uh, compared to any other continents. Food insecurity is a big challenge in East Africa and some parts of the southern part of Africa. We have been having uh, not only heavy rains that have destroyed crops, but we also we have been having locusts that have been destroying the remaining crops. Poverty is a big deal as far as Africa is concerned, if you look at all the regions of the African continent. And of course, climate change uh, devastates Africa more than any other continent. Uh, two aspects that are really of importance, rural and urban dwelling ratios, uh, and also high youth uh, demographic dividend. 
I mean, these have played themselves in a very interesting way in the COVID period because of the fact that uh, it has been demonstrated that Africans are able to do as much work in their villages as they can do in town uh, because of the fact that they've been restricted movements. So this is key in the sense that Africa can begin to see its urban strategy, uh, urbanization in a different way uh, because of the fact that if the right infrastructure was to be put in the villages, we can be able to preserve the villages the way that we know them now. And I think that'll be good uh, because it preserves some of the African culture. And of course, in terms of the youth uh, dividend, I mean, there have been predictions in terms of how COVID would affect the continent. But obviously, because we've had a healthy young population, this has also played uh, to our advantage. But obviously, as I said at the beginning, that empathy is the key of how we do our business at the AAS, and these issues have to be addressed. So, um, uh, you know, if we focus on the health challenges uh, uh, to start with, uh, we know the state of Africa in terms of the numbers that are there, but we know that the critical areas are in the areas of communicable diseases, uh, non-communicable diseases, neglected tropical diseases, and of course the epidemics uh, and, uh, and, and the situation that we are facing now. So that demands and pr provides opportunities for science, technology, and innovation to really address some of these issues that are of concern. And of course, uh, this is the topic that uh, brings us together this, uh, uh, this, uh, this early evening. Uh, so um, I just want to say to you that, you know, at the African Academy of Sciences, we have what we call the IESA platform. IESA stands for the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa. Uh, this came to being uh, through our partners uh, and the business plan is anchored around the AAS strategic plan, where the thinking, the theme, the concept is about shifting the center of gravity uh, in terms of African science. Shifting the center of gravity relates to us being able to provide funding for the African researchers and them being able to decide on what exactly they want to work on. And of course, uh, the AAS plays an important role of being the center of distribution of this type of funding so that we can begin to ensure that there's accountability and of course we are able to uh, address the concerns for the African researchers. So through our theory of change we have got four goals or four pillars. Uh, the first of which is about building R&D and leadership environments. This is very key because we can't do research when the environment is not allowing. We can't do research if we don't have the right type of leadership. So we have been building uh, leadership in research so that we can begin now to uh, precipitate activities around these future leaders of the continent. Uh, the second goal obviously is to support the development of innovation and science-driven entrepreneurial culture. This links very well with the third goal uh, where we are looking at rise, rising research leaders which are our postdoctoral fellows. So whenever I talk to Moses, Moses always tells me that you know goal number two and goal number three relate in a very interesting way because of the fact that on one hand you can have entrepreneurs who are not necessarily uh, researchers and of course you can also have researchers who are not having the innovative entrepreneurial mind so you know both sides uh, are seemingly are feeding each other and we are you know enjoying to see uh, different aspects emerge out of this and of course uh, this uh, makes the engagement uh, this early evening to be very very appropriate so the other issue that we look at is that as we build the capacities, as we train these young researchers, uh, we begin to see some critical gaps. We begin to see some gaps that need to be addressed so that we can begin to really optimize this uh, research environment so that the researchers are able to do their work. Uh, so I just want to conclude by highlighting some of the outcomes that have come from uh, some of these uh, 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 efforts uh, from, from, from the team uh, in partnership with our partners and of course with the important role that you have played. Uh, of course in terms of building R&D uh, leadership and infrastructure we are operating in more than 23 African countries. Uh, we have a continuous engagement with more than 53 African institutions and we are in, uh, uh, in the process of training uh, more than 1,500 uh, 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 students, uh, postdocs, etc. And of course, this will help build the requisite uh, uh, research capacity for the continent. Uh, if we look at innovation and science and entrepreneurship, this is a very important uh, sector. And of course, the efforts now is to make sure that 
for all the innovators that we have engaged with, not the ones that have received money from us, but even those that have tried to get some money from us, we want to make sure that we build this ecosystem where there could be engagement, where people can be able to share ideas. And of course, uh, this is a very critical uh, focus of today's discussion. Rising research leaders, of course, we've uh, trained more than 250 postdoctoral researchers. Uh, these have been in, in, in varied areas of focus from climate change, food, health, agriculture, engineering, natural and social sciences. And of course, uh, through our partnerships with NIH and Gates, we have some of these uh, postdocs based in the US. Uh, and of course, um, the majority of, of our postdocs are trained in the African continent. And in terms of looking at the critical gaps, uh, we have promoted uh, uh, where the researchers have to begin with the end in mind, where they engage with the community, where they are looking at the research questions, and of course, issues of science communication, sharing of the research uh, in the open research platform, and ensuring that good uh, financial practices are promoted through our ASO certified standard, the good financial grant practice. So with that uh, uh, brief overview of our activities and what we are doing, I just want to hand it back over to Juliet and I look forward to hearing all these innovative ideas uh, because I feel that the marketplace is open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Toto. In 2019, at the Grand Challenges Annual Meeting in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the African Academy of Sciences and World Health Organization unveiled a strategic partnership to leverage innovations and sustainably scale them up to guarantee a healthier and more productive future for Africa. Our keynote speaker and partner is WHO Afro's regional advisor, Dr. Modric Chibi. Dr. Chibi is a creator and lead of the WHO Africa Innovation Challenge, a program that launched in November 2018 with the goal of ultimately identifying and recognizing the top 30 healthcare innovations, improving access to quality healthcare in Africa. Welcome, Dr. Chibi. Thank you. I just sound check, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you very much to my uh, colleagues from Africa Academy of Science uh, for this opportunity to discuss uh, uh, this uh, important agenda, which I think uh, if we join our efforts, like you have just said, uh, we need to uh, improve or even transform the health sector. Um, I'm waiting to see the projection of my slides uh, so that I can uh, I can. Okay, so you can uh, you can move quickly to the next slide. So just as a start, I thought maybe uh, we need to align ourselves uh, with uh, with what uh, we mean by innovation, because uh, as you know that innovation can mean different things to uh, different people depending uh, where you are and uh, uh, the state at which you are in terms of uh, development phase. Uh, what we can call innovation may not necessarily be an innovation to uh, other settings. So, uh, but uh, in, in the development sector, basically, we uh, define innovation as a new solution with the transformative ability to accelerate impact. So, if you're looking at the innovation, we, are, we know that uh, it's fueled by a number of factors, uh, technology, availability of equipment, uh, research and development, uh, the use of intellectual property and skilled uh, workforce, uh, engineering, design, uh, availability of software. We see this a lot, uh, especially among our youth, where they are uh, developing a number of uh, interesting applications. Uh, and also um, the culture that is either fostered at organizational level or even at, uh, at national level. So when we are talking of innovation output, this could be either a new or improved product uh, or services. And uh, this can also entail new or improved business processes or new business models and uh, also the, the, the organizational uh, culture change. Uh, but what is most importantly is uh, the outcome of uh, the innovation. 
So when we are looking at the success or when we are defining success of an innovation, we look at the impact of the number of people saved or the number of lives uh, improved. And uh, to what extent is your innovation uh, decreased the inequity gap? These are some of the uh, outcome measures that we look for when we are defining an innovation as a successful innovation. An innovation should be in a position to be scaled. Uh, scalability is actually one of the most important elements. Uh, when we're talking of uh, scale, it can be either uh, vertically, uh, meaning to say the same innovation can be multiplied or replicated in a country, or it can be horizontal, uh, meaning to say it can also uh, be, be replicated across countries. And some other people uh, tend to repeat this as uh, one for many or many for one. And another important aspect is uh, to what extent is uh, your innovation uh, attracted the interest of government in terms of its, uh, be, it being sustainable? And uh, to what extent is it also be integrated into the broader health system space uh, for, 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 for obvious reasons uh, in terms of uh, uh, sustainability? Next slide. So, um, having said that, I just thought to paint a picture of the innovation throughput in Africa. There are a number of studies uh, that depict uh, the, the state of uh, innovation or the situation analysis of innovation uh, ecosystem on the African country, but uh, on the African countries. Uh, but of interest to me, I just thought maybe I need to highlight this important work that was done by Awaipo. Um, uh, World Intellectual Property Organization uh, from their report where they uh, ranked uh, the performance of uh, uh, countries with respect to innovation and they come up with the Global Innovation Index. Uh, as you can see from the uh, map uh, on your right, uh, there are only seven sub-Saharan countries that were ranked among the top 100. And this uh, is uh, South Africa, Botswana, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Senegal, and Mauritius. Mauritius is not showing there, it's somewhere in the middle of the uh, Indian Ocean. A number of assessments or attributes were assessed uh, to come up with this innovation index. Uh, this puts availability of institutions, which is very, very important to foster either development or scaling of uh, innovations. We're talking of research institutions, we're talking of incubators, we're talking of accelerators, uh, all the uh, institutions that can actually uh, stimulate either development or scaling of uh, health innovations uh, was actually assessed. The availability of uh, skilled workforce, uh, the availability of infrastructure. Uh, we know like in the African context, uh, context uh, internet connectivity is actually uh, still a major challenge and uh, some other countries actually leverage connectivity to spin off some of the innovations that uh, uh, require uh, internet connectivity and uh, market sophistication. So this is also another area which they, uh, they actually zoom in uh, to try and define what are the market dynamics at play in countries. Is it a competitive market space or is it more monopolistic? Uh, are you able to actually uh, do some uh, market segmentation to identify your own niche? Uh, same applies to business sophistication. Uh, this uh, they took into consideration certain business operations, availability of uh, 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 business network, uh, the supply chain, and also uh, what is the competitive uh, landscape in terms of uh, uh, your, 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 in terms of your own business. And these uh, uh, five attributes that I've just uh, uh, highlighted uh, con constitute the, the input for what they measured uh, in terms of uh, uh, the input sub-index uh, section. And the output sub-index scores uh, only constituted uh, the, 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 the knowledge and technology output as well as creative output. And all these combined and computed, they actually came up with a uh, global in, in innovation index. 
And uh, uh, sadly, we're still actually far behind in terms of catching up with the rest of the world. Next slide. So this is not to really uh, paint a bleak picture in terms of uh, where Africa is uh, with, uh, with innovation. Uh, there are several studies that have pointed towards uh, uh, Africa being in a better position to harness innovation. This includes also the studies that uh, were done by the World Bank. Uh, as you know, uh, innovation is a key differentiating feature that defines long-term sustainable impact. And innovation has now been used as a transformative tool or a transformative approach to accelerate attainment of certain uh, of global targets. I take, for instance, in the health sector, universal health coverage and uh, also sustainable development goal. I remember the, uh, the, the Secretary General of uh, the UN uh, through the Decade of Action Blueprint. You realize that uh, uh, leveraging new technologies and digital innovation is at the center of that blueprint. And there is also increasing demand for innovation that are inspired by the contextual needs uh, to generate sustainable solutions. And this speaks to the homegrown solutions. And this is exactly what WHO is also championing and advocating to have uh, those sustainable homegrown solutions. We know that uh, they, they, they stand a chance of being sustainable because they, are, they have been developed in the context of their own uh, challenges. And uh, we do have an opportunity to harness our own regional assets. We know that uh, we can tap into the demographic dividend. We have a youthful population and there is increasing penetration of information and communication technologies. And our youth are quite uh, fervent and energetic to actually harness uh, the opportunities that are brought by the ICT. And if appropriately managed, we know that innovations can reduce the inequity gap, which is very, very uh, essential, especially when we are talking of, uh, of uh, attributes for attaining uh, global health, issues around access, issues around affordability, issues around quality of uh, those services. And another uh, opportunity that innovation offers is a chance to leapfrog the current health system in many African countries, simply because uh, uh, there is lower sunk cost related to existing infrastructure. We can do away with some of the old uh, ways because uh, there isn't much cost that is associated with doing away with that and obviously adopting the new way of doing things. And uh, our regulatory environment is relatively less structured and we can exploit this to our advantage to quickly deploy solutions uh, that can actually uh, result in immediate impact. Next slide. So, uh, this, uh, I just wanted to uh, depict and also uh, uh, demystify this myth that uh, when you come up with, uh, with a cool innovation or with a cool gadget, uh, it will find itself uh, in the market space. And uh, this is why it's important to have a functional ecosystem at country level, at local government level. So as you know that uh, yeah, when we are talking of innovation, we don't want it to be only from a push side where funding can push development of innovation that are not necessarily tailored to meet uh, the, the, the needs of, of the market that it's, it's intended to, to sell. And when we are talking of uh, uh, the, the role of government, we are actually advocating for government to uh, facilitate an ecosystem uh, that will enable uh, supply of innovation that will find its way to the market and serve uh, the need of especially the most vulnerable population. And what are these elements that we are talking about? What we are advocating uh, here at WHO is we want countries to be in a position to institutionalize some kind of innovation scaling platform at the highest level. We know that uh, there is so much uh, uh, activity on the supply side when it comes to generation of uh, 
uh, innovative ideas. But the same is not translated when it comes to scaling of innovation. And this can only uh, be done when a systematic or uh, a systematic mechanism is put in place, especially at national level. And also what is needed is uh, streamlining of information managing, management system when it comes to innovation. What do I mean? This is a two way. If a government uh, or a local government can articulate the needs on the ground, this can actually inform uh, what innovations are going to be uh, generated to meet those demands. So that information is very important. Uh, needs assessment, as well as defining certain challenges that innovations can actually leverage. Uh, the other thing is we also advocating for government to find a, a systematic way of collecting information that is coming from the innovation pipeline and do an assessment, do a cost benefit analysis so that their efforts in terms of promoting or even supporting this innovation are informed by evidence. And another rel relatively important uh, aspect is alignment of policies across different sectors. This is exactly what we are also advocating at uh, WHO. What do I mean by aligning of policies across different sectors? Take, for instance, the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Health, the industry sector. What we have been seeing is the definition of success when it comes to the Ministry of Science and Technology is how many uh, innovators have they funded. So it's very much on the push side. But there is a disconnect as to what the demand is, what the health sector is actually defining as their needs. If there is a way of making these policies or strategies uh, somehow speak to each other, we see a difference uh, on the ground. Same applies to the industry. They should have access to some of the information that will facilitate uh, local production of some of these uh, innovations that span out or even emerging from uh, our innovators. This is very, very critical. The other thing that we are advocating is to incentivize uh, the innovation that are linked to the uh, needs of the vulnerable communities. And this is very important to reduce the inequity gap that I've been uh, talking about. We know that engagement uh, with uh, key stakeholders is very, very important. And we are also advocating for a coordinated mechanism to making sure that all stakeholders have equal access to relevant information, either from the demand side, either from the supply side. And for sustainability purposes, there should be a platform whereby these uh, tested and validated products will find their space in being integrated into the broad health system space. And of course, as we all know that uh, innovation is a dynamic uh, uh, space where people need to be continuously trained and we are also championing uh, updating either health workforce as well as key decision makers uh, in management of, uh, of innovation and leadership. Next slide. So having said that, we have realized they are guiding principles that we also have been advocating. One is leadership. We know leadership is very, very important. There we have a number of case studies where countries that have shown leadership and in integrating innovation into their leadership style, uh, they have uh, reaped so much results. Take for instance, uh, Rwanda. Uh, I've had a, a call with uh, with the minister and special advisor to the president of Niger yesterday, uh, you know, articulating the need for support in terms of pioneering uh, open innovation platform in that country. This is the kind of leadership that we are advocating. 
And we are also advocating fostering spirit of collaboration among key stakeholders because uh, innovation agenda is not a siloed kind of approach. It needs a coordinated approach, a comprehensive approach, all key stakeholders involved from the supply, from the facilitation, as well as from the demand side. What we also are advocating for is mainstreaming participation of women in innovation development. And also we are advocating for tailored funding to be directed uh, towards women's participation in the innovation space. Because what we have realized that in many instances, women are, women are left behind and, uh, uh, and this is obviously not good because some of the innovations are not user friendly for our, for, for, for our women. When it comes to the innovation pipeline, what we are encouraging is to prioritize those innovations that are generally focused on supporting the vulnerable and the poorest with that lasting development impact and also with multiplier effects for improved social well-being and economic prosperity. And this is actually key to us. And innovation must be inclusive. When we are talking of uh, marginalized groups, like disabled people, youth, older people, they are not supposed to be just users of innovation. They should participate in the designing of those innovations. When we are articulating uh, the agenda for innovation, we don't necessarily uh, emphasize on innovating around the challenges. Innovation around the person experiencing that challenge is very, very important. Because if you innovate uh, using uh, a human-centered approach, you can identify the pain points in that human interaction with climate. And this is very, very important to us. And of course, we know that uh, innovation is uh, a risk and endeavor. And what we are actually encouraging is evidence-based approach and also a responsible innovation. And innovation should have a no harm effect. Next slide. So just to uh, summarize our, 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 our role as WHO in the innovation space, and this is very much in line with our global uh, strategy, uh, which is called the uh, general program of work. What we have realized is uh, we have a comparative advantage, advantage, especially in addressing innovation barriers, and we can uh, play a role as a facilitator or a champion of champion of innovation in the three areas. One, shaping innovation, scaling up innovation, and amplifying innovation. What do I mean here? Shaping innovation, like what uh, Juliet has just said in her opening remarks, we organize and also partner with other strategic partners to shape innovation challenge calls that, match, that are matched to specific health-related needs, and especially that meet our global uh, standard for, uh, for, 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 for access to health, which is access, quality, and affordability. Here in WHO in the African region, we have done uh, an innovation challenge which unearthed more than 2,500 innovations. And a number of these innovators, uh, they are transitioning to scale thanks to some of the uh, uh, networks that we have activated uh, including the Africa Academy of Science through their uh, transition grants, as well as other uh, partners abroad in the U USA. Uh, we, uh, with respect to COVID-19, because we know that innovation is at the center of uh, strengthening some of the uh, uh, response areas related to COVID, we hosted a WHO, first WHO hackathon uh, to encourage co-development of certain of innovative and scalable approaches uh, that will respond uh, to some of the areas to do with contact tracing, surveillance, uh, infection prevention and control, uh, laboratory testing. And what we are actually seeing is uh, 
some of the uh, best profiled innovation that came out of this exercise are receiving further funding from uh, other global players or global funders. We have just recently launched uh, the Open Innovation Initiative, whereby uh, we want to tap into the best of two worlds. What do I really mean here? In the African region, we are in a best position to define our own challenges in a contextual way. So if we can define, we can leverage the global competences in terms of generating solutions or technologies that are tailored to uh, those uh, challenges. And this is an exercise that we thought uh, is very important in the current context of COVID-19. With respect to scaling up innovation, because we interface closely with the government, we know that we do have this influential factor and we can catalyze scaling up of high impact innovation that we have either assessed or endorsed. In the African region, we have developed a regional strategy for scaling in health innovation. And this is a continental strategy uh, to guide countries on how to scale uh, innovation sustainable in their particular uh, countries. We have embarked on a brokerage function, like I said before, we have connected our innovators with some of the funders and Africa Academy of Science is one of the funders that uh, if, uh, our innovators have actually benefited from through their uh, transition to scale uh, innovation grant. And uh, as innovations are tested, what we are beginning to do is to influence the policy space by generating evidence to inform uh, that exercise. And uh, we are actually very excited because now WHO is uh, ahead of the curve in terms of generating policy guidance for either emerging technologies or digital innovation. And the last part is on amplifying innovation, where we communicate success and lesson learned is key to further scaling up in sustainability of innovation. As you know that we, we launched our first in a series of webinar session to showcase African innovations that are emerging from our continent to respond to COVID. And this is an exercise which is gaining so much attraction and attention from the rest of the continent. And furthermore, we, are, we, are, we have developed an online platform uh, for various stakeholders to access information on emerging innovation that they can either adapt in their own setting. And we are beginning to see uh, the, uh, the link between leadership and innovation. And like I said before, we are seeing where leadership is shown and integration of uh, uh, innovation is, is exercised. We're seeing results on the ground. And this exactly is something that we want to promote region whereby we want to showcase how leadership can be implemented alongside innovation to push forward the innovation agenda. Next slide. So this is uh, over from me, but if you want more information related to what we are doing at WHO, uh, you are welcome to write us an email on that uh, address uh, shown. Thank you so much, Julian, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Chivi, for that keynote insightful presentation on innovation impact, scale, and sustainability, particularly Africa's ranking of innovation performance. Um, our next, our last present presentation is from my colleague, uh, Dr. Moses Andrew, the challenges of Africa for money. Thank you so much, uh, Juliet, and uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Chibi, for that very, very insightful presentation, um, especially around uh, the WHO's involvement in innovation. This is really good to see. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, could I have the next slide? Next slide, please. So um, I'm, I'm really excited today uh, for the simple reason that uh, we are launching GK. Uh, GK actually stands for Grand Challenges Africa Innovation Network. 
um, which uh, is a product of uh, you know the Grand Challenges family. Um, and of course, you'll be seeing uh, some members of the Grand Challenges family talking today. But this particular journey started uh, way back when Grand Challenges was formed. There was a thought and a recognition that there was need to actually create um, a place uh, where various different leaders and members of the innovation ecosystem can actually come to and have discussions that are pertinent for the development and success of innovations. So in September 2018, we put out a survey uh, to our African-based innovators who had been uh, part of the Grand Challenges family. And uh, it was interesting to see that out of the survey, we, we, we learned some uh, uh, First of all was that uh, there was a lack of essential industry and market connections, really applying what Modric has just talked about, uh, you know, market sophistication. Um, we do have unfavorable regulatory policies, of course, and then the innovators lack funding to translate their ideas from lab to prototypes. There was limited entrepreneurial capacity development for the innovators, especially in the field of science. Uh, so uh, in, in, fintech, in fintech, it's a pretty developed market, but uh, um, we, need, we need to do a little bit better in health and development. Um, and then uh, the partnership to produce products and services was also not where it's supposed to be. Uh, so next slide, please. We, we, we uh, started to really ask the question, what is that that we need to do to just bring together the innovation ecosystem on the African continent up to speed and up to a place where, um, you know, innovations can be seeded by ideas from various different places because we all know that uh, crowdsourcing is really the way forward. And out of, uh, again, um, the, the uh, survey that we put out, uh, it was quite clear that uh, um, innovators were requesting for an online profile for virtual interaction, uh, including websites, e-market, blogs, feedback, and uh, any, any, any kind of information that will put, uh, you know, networking at the top of the discussions um, going forward. There were face-to-face -face interactions that were actually uh, asked for, market pitches, and also peer interaction, uh, including others, which I really will not go to. Uh, next slide. And so uh, it, was, it was important that uh, we, we, we listen to our innovators and also in the text that uh, we gave to some of you to actually tell us about what you really needed from the African Academy of Sciences, when we asked the question, um, what suggestions would you give to the African Academy of Sciences, um, uh, the Grand Challenges Africa program to run phase two? Uh, this is what you say, that you would like us to create a platform or a mechanism for connection amongst awardees, innovators, and other stakeholders. Uh, of course, you wanted a, an, an expanded call coverage uh, again, more about uh, more platforms, more call meetings, uh, pitches for self-marketing, um, and then also just looking at uh, 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 funding um, and capacity building and training. So I won't go through the whole list, uh, but you can see there uh, in terms of uh, what we are currently reacting to. Next slide. So over the last uh, two years, next slide, please. Over the last two years, the African Academy of Sciences um, went out to develop um, a place, an e-marketplace, where we can actually uh, work together as members of the innovation ecosystem on the African continent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and. Uh, in a way, we, we, we came up with uh, this in, um, space where we can interact as innovators and members of the innovation ecosystem. Uh, we can connect. Uh, it is virtual. Uh, we can talk to each other. We can message, message each other. We can showcase our innovations. We can create focus and focus groups. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. 
and we can also, um, in a way, um, uh, start planting some seeds that will assist us move towards scale up. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm quite proud uh, today to actually introduce you to GK in Africa. And the call to action is really to um, get out your phones uh, or even your web app. Uh, it is available on uh, uh, Google Play and uh, it is also available on uh, iTunes, uh, GKN, as, as shown there. So if you type into your web page HTTPS, of course, uh, GKN Africa, or even just search on Google, GKN.Africa, you should be able to find the link. Um, please join. Uh, it will allow you to create a profile, um, and it will also allow you to uh, um, uh, not just a profile for yourself, but also a profile for uh, your project. And even if you're a single innovator and you've got various different innovations, you can create a profile for each of your innovations in this particular uh, 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 fields. And then after that, um, there are some advantages of, of, of joining. So for example, uh, there's secure access uh, that uh, will, you, will, you will find there. You can create uh, both public and private groups in uh, uh, this uh, GKN platform that we are providing for you. So for example, let's say you are an innovator in maternal and neonatal child health. Um, you could join the MNCH uh, discussion groups. You could join the water sanitation and hygiene discussion groups. Or if you're into data sciences, uh, then you can actually move into that. So really, um, you as the content providers are the ones who are going to show us the way forward, uh, how we are supposed to move, how we connect to each other, and how we build, um, uh, you know, just a nice network that can be something that will rival what is out there. Um, you can message privately in uh, GKN. Uh, you can also message publicly if you want to send out something to everybody. You will have a feed of information from people whom you follow. And uh, you know people can also follow you back. Um, you could have private discussions with people. And uh, the other important thing is that we've ensured that it is compliant to, uh, of course, the GDPR standards. And it's also compliance to the industry standards in data security. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just again to say that uh, please uh, uh, get in, uh, register, create the profile, uh, search for other users, search for each other, search for people who've got innovations like you, uh, connect to other users, engage, and access some of our resources. So for example, uh, details of our transition to scale call uh, for um, Grand Challenges Africa together with our partners, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also CEDA from Sweden uh, um, is, is posted in there. So if you want to know more, uh, you should actually, um, you know, just get in and then find it there. Next slide. So, um, <clears throat> We, 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 we really want to uh, do a little bit more. We've already had two iterations of uh, this particular GKN. Uh, so, I mean, just go in, have a look. We will continue developing it. And uh, um, where we see any types of features, we are ready to actually uh, go on and uh, make it uh, even, even better. Next slide. Yeah, so, so lastly from me, um, I would just like to uh, thank our partners, uh, CEDA Sweden and also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, whose uh, you know, support has actually made uh, GKN um, successful and or available uh, uh, to African innovators. Um, when, when we started this particular project, um, we were thinking about you know, the innovation network, the critical innovation mass that is there in uh, the Boston area in Massachusetts or in the Silicon Valley in uh, um, uh, 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 California or even uh, the Savannah Silicon here in Nairobi. 
And we thought that um, why can't we take that and make it uh, virtual for African innovators so that an innovator seated out in Abidjan, for example, would still be exposed to the various different groups that they need for them to actually uh, make their innovations succeed. Uh, so our ambition is to have the biggest health and development innovation network in Africa. Um, and uh, we encourage you to uh, you know, talk to your various different innovators that are there in your universities, institutions, uh, members of your networks, if you are an accelerator or an incubator, uh, or if you're a funder, uh, you know, people you funded before so that uh, we can we can, we can be able to move. So um, I will probably just stop there and uh, thank you all for being a part of this launch. So thanks again. Um, go in, uh, search for gkane.africa and sign up. Thank you, Jigia. Thank you, Moses. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, your wish has been our command. The GKN platform has now officially been launched. So we are joined by remarkable panelists to give us some insights on the space GKN is occupying and how it will disrupt the African innovation ecosystem. Allow me to briefly give you a quick introduction to each of our panelists before we launch into a brief Q&A. A reminder to ask your questions on the chat section on the right hand side of the screen. I'll begin with Kedes Tesla Georges, um, who is a de deputy director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Grand Challenges Exploration focuses on issues if solved could lead to key advances in preventing cheating and curing diseases of the developing world. Kedes has worked with some of the most creative minds in Africa, and you will find a detailed uh, bio for all our panelists on the site and the handouts, which has been shared by the African Academy of Sciences. We are also joined by Amit Thaka, who is the executive chair of the Africa Health Business and the Kenya Healthcare Federation. The Africa Health Business fosters effective public-private partnership initiatives in health in Africa. The organization has expertise targeted towards supporting governments, corporates, health organizations, and development partners to promote the innovation ecosystem. Our third panelist is Carly Silva. She is a co-CEO of Grand Challenges Canada. GCC is one of the key partners of Grand Challenges Africa and has supported innovations in various stages of development in Africa. G GCC has also contributed to the development of the innovation ecosystem in Africa. And she is a, a key partner of the Grand Challenges Africa. Dixon Chibanda, who will join us a bit later, is a director for African Mental Health Research Initiative and the Friendship Bench. If, uh, the Friendship Bench is one of the celebrated innovations for mental health coming out of Africa. And I'm sure some of you have seen Prince William uh, really promoting the Friendship Bench. The innovation has grown from proof of concept to scaling to a rollout in Zimbabwe, Kenya, USA, the Netherlands, and other countries. Now, in, in, a, in a normal meeting, we will be having applauses. So I will, I will expect that you're clapping wherever you are. So allow me to welcome our panelists. I'll begin with Kedest. Um, and the first question to you, Kedest, is what will partners be looking for in the future for innovations in Africa? Hi, Juliet. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Can you confirm if you can hear me? Yes, we can, Kedest. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Kedestas Fagiorgis. I am uh, part of the Gates Foundation uh, Global Partnership and Grand Challenges team. Pleasure uh, to be here. Super exciting to launch GK. This has been in the works for uh, more than a couple of years and uh, uh, very, very exciting to see uh, and um, looking forward to, to go in and, and play around. Uh, Chibi, uh, very um, excited to hear your presentation about WHO Afro as well. Um, so it looks like uh, the, the vision that you had and the discussions that we all had is, is uh, becoming more and more real. So um, in terms of uh, answering your question, Juliet, uh, from what are partners looking in the future for innovation in Africa, 
So one of the reasons why everyone keeps talking about innovation is that uh, there is a fundamental belief uh, that if we create the right uh, environment uh, for innovation, uh, innovation and, and make it easier for people to innovate and participate, then scientific innovation can help us solve problems and transform lives very quickly. So you could think of the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, is uh, the deadline is fast approaching in, in exactly 10 years. And we all know that unless, unless we have innovation to come up with a transformative solution, we cannot achieve the SDGs. Uh, if you look at the COVID efforts right now, uh, companies in, in places like Kenya are reimagining themselves and designing and producing local EPPs. Um, there was a coverage on, on Quartz uh, a few weeks ago that I saw that a Nigerian fashion designer bringing glamour uh, to masks to help raise awareness about social distancing and the importance of, of wearing masks. So engineers in all corners of the world trying to make cheaper version of respirators to their local hospitals, knowing that there is um, lack of uh, right equipment. So even in this green grim time, there is cause for all of us to for optimism because we're seeing the creativity of innovators all around the world um, to, to solve the COVID uh, problem. So the question that most of us as, as partners are asking or ought to be asking in my mind what is our role as enablers so we can capture the world's imagination and make it easier for people to innovate? And how can we do it quickly so those innovation can reach people who need them, uh, whether it is uh, COVID at the moment or whether it is in the maternal and health space or sanitation space, you, you, you name it. So while innovation ecosystems are complex, um, as, as Chibi's presentation showed us this morning, and very much context specific, I like to think of three main ingredients of success. Uh, so obviously the first one is you know, the actual innovator, the people, uh, the resources that they need and focus. So in terms of, of people, First and foremost, we need creative people close to the issues that require solutions and that are empowered to work on them. So in other words, for this particular context, science for Africa will be most effective when it's led by Africans. You have the context, you're closer to the, to the problem, you, you think about them, you see them, you have the context, the cultural, the uptake, um, all those will need to be um, closer to the problem. In terms of resources, um, and this is where I think Juliet's question comes into place. I'm particularly excited, for instance, by what Moses has, has launched this morning on GKane and the work that the African Academy of Science and our partners in South Africa, NEPAD Arda, are doing in establishing and mobilizing funding for innovation in science, particularly from within Africa. So I think it will be easier to do things quickly if we find ourselves and we can find ourselves hopefully in a co-funding environment where innovation from Africa is supported from within and global partners come in as co-funders in whatever way that, 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 that makes sense for each of the partners. So um, we need funding and resources to support uh, those local innovators and their innovation at every stage of the process from, from discovery all the way to, to delivery. But of course, funding is, 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 is important, but it's not the only uh, important thing. So we need focus. Um, what I mean by that is that we need policies that encourage prioritization and a coordinated support from public and private partners, local and global partners. So we, we are relentless in our effort to focus and support an entire ecosystem uh, so innovators can, can create, can test, 
can fail and be okay with the failing and that we are tolerant with the failing and, and eventually come up with products that will help uh, change people's lives. We need uh, the right regulatory environment. We need access to um, really good innovative space that allows to, to go in and, and, and share ideas. So G came to me is the start of that uh, ecosystem that is going to be easier to connect people to people. So you have um, thought partnership that would help you think through some of the business development, for instance. If you're a scientist and you're not trained to build a business, it would be fantastic if G came would allow you to easily find a partner. It would be important for GK to play a role in connecting um, mentors uh, who have gone through the path uh, that, that you're hoping to go so you don't have to recreate on your own and that you can accelerate your work a little bit quicker if you have the mentorship available to you. We want GK to hopefully connect people and ideas to the resources they need. And by resources, it could be money, it could be lab access, it could be network access in all kinds of ways. So um, I, I like to think of it as a cohesive and comprehensive approach to harness innovation and a thoughtful approach with various ingredients in place is what I am looking as your partner to, to support you. So a very comprehensive approach, a thoughtful approach where each of us could come and complement each other where our return for investment could be very clear and easy to justify as we make a case to support a project. So um, I'm super excited about GK. Uh, it's um, um, congratulations for the African Academy of Sciences to make this a reality and, and looking forward uh, to play around with it myself. Thanks back to you, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, Kedes. We are very excited to have been able to launch GKN despite not having a physical launch, but uh, I think this is just as good. Uh, Kali, we see you nodding as Kedes was talking. I think you share some of the experiences when it comes to the innovation ecosystem. So Grand Challenges uh, Canada has implemented innovation programs around the world, including in Africa. What are some of the key lessons learned about African innovation ecosystem that you could talk to? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Excellent, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and very exciting to see this, uh, another milestone be hit by uh, Grand Challenges Africa. Um, we are a huge champion um, of Grand Challenges Africa and look to um, play that role that Cadest um, just talked about in terms of um, being a, uh, a supporter um, in the way of following um, on funding from uh, things that are identified on the African continent um, to be to be pushed forward as innovations um, to, to solve the sustainable development goals. When Grand Challenges Canada was launched about 10 years ago, one of our key differentiators was and really still is a focus on funding innovators in low and middle income countries. We were really explicit about a goal to move away from colonial models of development where ideas would flow from high income countries to low income countries as a model to, to one that actually the innovators who are closest to a challenge are also the ones who are developing, testing and scaling solutions. We think that this allows leaders to pull in the assets that exist in every society into solutions that would be innovative, intuitive, and actually last. In the last decade, we have supported over 400 innovation projects led by organizations in 30, over 30 um, African countries. It's about 100 million Canadian dollars, 80 million US dollars over this period of time. And many of these have been in small grants that provide an opportunity to test an idea and provide evidence that is promising. So kind of that phase one or the seed, um, seed level. And some of them are focused on increasing the maturity of the team, of the organization, of the innovation, 
and to test the ways to scale and sustain a solution once it's got some evidence behind it. We call this transition to scale, equivalent to a phase two um, kind of funding level. And because innovation only has impact when it scales and is sustained, this is what we think is really important to move forward. We support ideas with seed funding in order to build a pipeline that, of solutions that can be transitioned to scale. So that's our real goal. Select broadly, give a lot of people opportunity to test their ideas, and then selectively transition to scale those that are looking most promising. Overall, we see about 35% who receive seed funding um, uh, don't end up having the evidence at the end of it to say, this is promising and, and the time and effort is worthwhile. So it's, it's a third of it and, and that's expected. We're doing innovative things, not everything's gonna work. Um, and sometimes it takes longer with more money in order to get to that point as well. But about 25% who receive seed funding from us end up moving to transition to scale. About a third of those funded by Grand Challenges Canada and about two thirds of those funded by others. But I wanna emphasize one thing that I think is important and that what I think G. Kane is really starting to land on here is this um, success rate that we see is substantively lower in places like Kenya and Uganda where we have massive amounts of seed funding to, than it is in places like India. And it's interesting, I wanna, I wanna hold that thought and say like, what is it that's different that we could actually solve for here? Um, a few of the, the key factors that people cite, these innovators cite, um, that allow them to make the jump from a seed to a transition to scale are things like partnerships, um, local support and demand. So really getting to what Mo Chibi was talking about on really having that demand pull. Um, having a strong um, team, and that often involves bringing in new capacities to a team um, that are quite different from the ones that were needed in order to prove a concept um, or initially test an innovation. And I think this is really interesting when you compare it to um, what uh, the key reasons that people um, who don't transition to scale cite as their challenges. Those are a lack of funding, and then a lack of the partnerships to take them to the next level. So I think with, with players like Grand Challenges Africa and which with platforms like um, GCANE, um, I think this, the funding part we can start to solve for, but I think it's really powerful to see how some of these other ideas of local demand, of partnerships, et cetera, could be strengthened. I was going back to this idea of what's different between some of the Indian versus the um, the uh, uh, Kenyan example for just to give two countries examples where we play. Um, we also see a lot um, less mentorship um, by those who have experience in actually taking an idea from an idea stage through to an impact stage through to scale. Um, for those who are first timers on that path. Um, and we see that less so in um, Kenya than we do see it in places like Bangalore, which has become a massive tech hub in the world. And I think it's a really interesting, one of the things that was surfaced by um, a, an interesting study that came, that was done by Endeavor in late 2018, um, which compared the Nairobi and the Bangalore ecosystems. Um, and the big thing was um, this, this um, entrepreneurial connection between the, the uh, systems that existed. In B Bangalore, tech founders who succeeded at building large companies often reinvested their resources back into the community by supporting former employees who launched their own firms and act as mentors and investors in those firms. Contrast that to the situation that we see in Nairobi, and instead it's very much based on a whole bunch of incubators, accelerators, and other support mechanisms, which have made um, the, the Nairobi software sector one of the highest, um, most heavily supported entrepreneurship communities in the world. But it hasn't translated into this scale that we see in other parts of the world. And so thinking through how can we get that one of the key um, things that this report pulled out, that mentorship of those who have done it before, 
actually be, be um, feeding into uh, helping those who are on that path for the first time and have really viable solutions that could go forward, but don't want to spend all the time and effort and money um, in recreating the, the problems that could exist along that path. Um, and I think that's why it's exciting to have Amit and others on this phone who are on this uh, panel who actually have have done it in the past and are taking that role and looking forward to seeing how Duquesne can actually push things forward um, in that vein going forward. Um, so a huge thank you for me and uh, and really a big congratulations and back over to you, Juliet. Thank you, Carly. Um, I'd like to welcome back uh, Moses, Nelson and Modric. Um, if they're still on the call. Unfortunately, we've lost Amit, Taka, and Dixon due to other engagements. However, they had left their comments, which I will read out um, once I've had from Moses, uh, Dr. Chibi, and Nelson. Uh, so Moses, I have you uh, here. The question we wanted to ask that you could speak to, and Nelson, I'm picking up a question also from the chat room. I'll start with uh, Nelson. Nelson, the question is, the critical challenge of innovation in Africa is acceptance and funding and innovation, particularly in health. What are some of the measures taken by AAS and its partners to ensure acceptance and funding of an African innovation by its government and its people? Wow, that's, that's a very tough one, isn't it? Uh, it's a very tough one, Juliet. Um, clearly, I think, when I was giving my introductory remarks, I did show the four pillars that are driving some of our activities. And of course, I did show that we are interested in addressing critical gaps, and we are also interested in building the requisite uh, capacity and infrastructure and environment. And one of the issues that I raised was the issue of uh, community engagement. So clearly, uh, you know, we need to find a way or there needs to be a clear platform where there is uh, direct engagement uh, between innovators and government. And you can say that GKN maybe is the starting point, you know. You want to be able to bring innovators in a single space where they can begin to share ideas. And we know that in an African setup, you know, what can be handled by two dogs is much easier than that what can be dealt with by one dog. So clearly you want to see a convergence of effort in terms of the players. And, and, and of course, you know, one of the key issues is that um, uh, uh, the best advocacy is some bit of success from time to time. I think it's good also to demonstrate to governments that there are things that can work and these things can be able to save lives. And on that basis, they can begin to have confidence in terms of uh, accepting things that are coming from the innovators. And clearly our relationship with the WHO in a way sort of um, uh, 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 amplifies that, that aspect in the sense that WHO, because of its recognition, because of its space and government, can begin to uh, leverage its, its power to, 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 to make governments aware that innovation is a critical point. And I guess, uh, Dr. Chibi, you can agree that that was really the premise for MOU because we want really to get into that space. Um, so before I go to the question for Modric and Moses, I just want to read out the responses from Dixon. We had a question prepared for Dixon earlier, and his question, the question to him um, was to share his experience of the African innovation landscape and what he would say are the biggest needs of African innovators. Are they being met and how can they be met? His response was African innovators need to tell their own stories. It is not just about publishing our work in peer-reviewed journals. We need to tell our story to the world. Africa from Cape Cairo has numerous but isolated pockets of excellence, and there is a need to speak to each other and innovate collectively. For Amit Taka, we had asked him what role the private sector plays in enhancing the innovation ecosystem in Africa, and is there more that can be done in this area? Um, his response was that, um, him, him and his colleagues at the Africa Health Business are extremely keen in assisting scale-up innovations and match them to the market. We look forward to our continued engagement with AES and, and partners, including the Development and Aid Foundation, the Grand Challenges Canada, as well as the private sector facilitators. Um, from the private sector, there couldn't be a better time to look for innovations for the market. However, 
Amit says, a gap in the market does not mean that there is a market in the gap. Perhaps I should repeat that. A gap in the market does not mean that there is a market in the gap. So Moses, I don't know if you wanted to add on a little bit about that in terms of GK occupying the gap in the market. And maybe you can also um, expound on the lessons that you are learning yourself from implementing Grand Challenges Africa about the innovation landscape and how you can use that ecosystem or landscape. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet, and uh, very, very interesting comments uh, from, from Amit, uh, really capturing uh, the, the uh, idea that uh, the problem that we have, um, well, part of the problem that we have with innovations and innovators on the African continent is that, um, the execution of the idea is sometimes poor. And uh, sometimes funding, uh, we totally accept that. But then again, uh, sometimes it is um, uh, connected to lack of, you know, uh, their appropriate partners that cannot work with them. Um, and uh, I mean, if if uh, you were to talk to a, a group, especially in fintech, uh, which we do not operate in, by the way. Uh, just to emphasize that uh, we promote innovations in science uh, that have got a science base um, and are focusing on health and developmental problems. Uh, you find that there's always a discussion about, um, you know, protecting IP, and percentage of the company that I own, uh, and uh, uh, this is how much uh, I, I want to sell you in terms of uh, what we are doing in this particular company. But at the end of the day, it's about satisfying market needs. Uh, so if we don't penetrate that particular, you know, you know, point, then it becomes very difficult for uh, our innovations to actually be. Uh, we really have to respond to the person who it pains the most to have the problem. So if your innovation is actually focusing on on, uh, 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 you know, something that it's the government who usually pays for it, then you have to uh, put it in a place where the government uh, can actually respond to it. So um, those are some of my, my my few comments at this point, Julia, thanks. Thank, thank you, Moses. I see that we're running out of time. So as we wind up, I will ask one last question to Modric, and then I will invite back Kali and Kades to just give us a quick one minute concluding remark. Um, Modric, the question for you is, is the world ready for innovations from Africa? Any innovations that WHO has identified for scale up? So I guess those are two questions in one. So maybe quick, punchy responses. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Juliet. Um, yes, indeed, the world uh, is, is ready for innovation from Africa. There are not ways about it. Um, <clears throat> But just to explain a bit, when we're talking of innovation from Africa, uh, yes, so we may, we need to be open-minded. Like I said, uh, there are platforms that we can use and leveraging global competencies uh, to uh, develop innovation that we want. One a case in point is open innovation. Our, our innovators can link with global players they can link up with global players and come up with the relevant large solutions that can make an impact on the ground. So it's not necessarily to say, uh, yes, it's an innovation from Africa by, uh, by an African. And we, we, we don't necessarily need to champion that per se. It, what we need to champion is solutions that are tailored to solve contextual challenges. And this and this can uh, be our own innovators that can network with global players to give that leverage, to tap into that leverage for them to develop. Because uh, it, mm, we should not promote uh, ourselves uh, developing some substandard kind of inno innovation. That's not what we represent. We represent quality innovations. We represent innovation that can promote access. We innovate. We, represent innovation that can be affordable. And all these attributes, if you leverage 
you the network around you, whether it's local, whether it's regional, whether it's global, but we should be the champions for uh, generating some of these innovations. This is what I can say. Okay. Um, I'd like, allow me to also invite back Marcus Kmol, who is from CEDA. Marcus uh, is one of the partners and funders of the GKN platform. Welcome, Marcus. Maybe you might you. have some comments on GKN and how you see it evolving. Well, first of all, let me, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, let me thank uh, thank you for for all the presentation uh, presentators for for the very interesting presentations and uh, I would like to congratulate the academy for uh, the launch of uh, of GCane. This is really an exciting uh, moment and we are proud. Uh, Cida is proud that we have been uh, part of this uh, this journey, and I think this journey has only begun and and we will see what uh, what uh, results we will have. Uh, uh, in in the in the future, I, for us, I mean, um, I mean, our our efforts in in Africa, I mean, they're evolving in in a good way. But as you know, I mean, there are challenges, and and sometimes it's even frustrating. And and one reason is uh, is a high degree of fragmentation, and that is both on the side of the innovators and the innovation systems, but then also on the on the funders' side. And I hope this uh, this new platform and and tool can uh, can help to. Uh, to reduce this uh, fragmentation and and to work together in a more uh, coherent uh, way and in that way also get uh, get faster to uh, to results that will have uh, have uh, impact. So I think this is a really really important uh, step. Thank you, Marcus. So last words from Carly and uh, Pedest. I hi. I just wanted to um, say congratulations again and. Um, also, just underline what I think um, Marjorie, you just said around um, kind of the global nature of innovations um, and link it back. I'm sad that Dixon wasn't able to present um, himself, but this idea that um, he had focused on a problem that no one in the world has solved. And I would say that most of the problems we currently face right now fall in that category where there are no places in the world that has figured out mental health. There are no places in the world that have figured out how to tackle COVID. I mean, we are all in this together. We have various capacities to bring to the table on it, um, but we are in an era where we need good ideas coming from everywhere. And um, the idea that you could be open um, to an, an innovation that is being defined and, and designed in a place like Zimbabwe for a mental health um, uh, kind of pandemic that we have in the world and that people around the world see how valuable that is and want to take it up is exactly what um, has happened with the friendship bench. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to be um, seeing more of that. So I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you, Kali. Yeah. Sure, Juliet, I think for me is, um, you know, how can we, for lack of better term, take advantage of the current crisis uh, to make it work for us, right? So COVID is not discriminating. Everyone is affected equally everywhere and no one has the answer. So this is the moment actually that we could make some of the people who were voiceless for a long time to shine and support them and, and be those enablers that we could be because we don't, the world doesn't have an answer so that it's going to, the world is going to listen, right? So yeah. I, like, like Carly, I, I absolutely think this is a really good moment to seize it and make it work so we can push the agenda that we're all passionate about and, and uh, make sure that we identify very, very quickly um, and support promising innovation from the continent so it can serve the world, sort of this Africa for the world uh, idea. So how fun would that be to, to have some innovation coming out of the continent that could actually help solve this uh, awful crisis that we're all dealing with? So um, I am an optimist by nature, so I'm super excited about that idea. and. Uh, look forward to work with all of you. But we also know that uh, attention uh, passes very, very quickly. This is a rare public um, 
attention on research and development or the lack of research and development for pandemic, it's not going to last for too long. So our, our um, challenge, as, as we all think about it, is how can we take advantage of this very, very quickly and make it work for, for the innovation pipeline on the continent? Thank you. Thank you, Fidesz. A really good comment. The GCAN platform has been a long time coming and there's never a good moment than the current one for its launch. Um, Marcus, any final words from the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA? Parting short? Um, very short. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I, I can only agree to, to what was uh, just uh, said. I mean, uh, we should i mean it's an opportunity and we should uh, use it and and then uh, i mean at some at some time from now we have to evaluate and and look what what it has led to but uh, but i'm also very optimistic and i think uh, this uh, this will be a valuable tool and uh, all together we can uh, i think we can achieve a lot and we appreciate the partnership that we have received from sida over the last few months two years modric final words from WHO afro in congo brazzaville Yep. No, just to reiterate that uh, innovation is not an event. Uh, it's 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 a journey. It's a journey. It uh, it involves lots of people, lots of key stakeholders. And uh, as African innovators, uh, you should try to tap into that, improve the quality of your work. It once you improve the quality of your work, by also opening up to external uh, support, uh, your innovation will receive all the accolades that other, it can actually be in that global competitive space with other uh, innovations, say from China or elsewhere. But we just need to emphasize that, yes, be the architect or the designer of your innovation, but where you think you lack competencies, find other uh, people to to partner with and move forward and improve the quality of your work over to you thanks modric some powerful words there i would like now to um leave leave us with some comments that the webinar is recorded so we will share it with all the participants we really encourage you to put any questions that you have on the side chat or the chat section and i would like to hand over to nelson um closing remarks thank you nelson thank you very much juliet for for you and the backroom uh, team for moderating this uh, webinar which i feel it has been very successful i can't even begin to repeat the words of uh, all the speakers i think what is important what i've learned is that uh, this is a good opportunity for africa to rise and obviously we should never waste an opportunity that a crisis presents to us uh, from an innovation perspective. Uh, in the continent, I think we've been able to witness governments uh, listening to scientists in terms of how they should conduct their business. And this has been quite a gratifying moment in terms of uh, seeing that science can really be uh, received and it can be used by governments to drive some of its decisions. So let me take this opportunity to thank you, Moses uh, and Tim. Uh, thank you to CEDA. Thank you to the Gates Foundation and all other uh, partners uh, for bringing us uh, the GK application. I also want to thank WHO for the partnership and also thank uh, Grand Challenges Canada. I know we've come a long way uh, in this partnership. Uh, colleagues, uh, friends, innovators, and partners, uh, GK is launched and the marketplace is open. I was saying to Moses earlier on that Africa from a landmass perspective is a very, very big continent. And I'm hoping that GK can begin to uh, close the gaps and enhance the interaction amongst the innovators. Thank you very much for participating in this webinar. I look forward to engaging with you in the future. Bye. <laughs>